Hello, hello friends and welcome to our show. This is a show that The Barricade produces with the analysis.news. I am your host, Maria Cernat. I am an academic based in Bucharest and with me is the co-host of the show, Bojan Stanislavski, a Bulgarian-born Polish journalist. Thank you for being here with us, Bojan. Hello, hello. Great to be here. And of course, Paul J, a journalist and filmmaker. He's the founder and host of the Analysis.news. And uh, he fil- his films won numerous awards at the major festivals around the world. And he was also chair of the Documentary Organization of Canada. And uh, he provides a very interesting commentary on al- analysis on the political uh, situations. Thank you for being here with us, Paul. Thank you, Maria. And Boy. So let's dive straight in. In the first part of the show, we are going to discuss how you, Paul, see things from uh, Canada, where you are currently based, and if this war in Ukraine is. Um, something that you've experienced since uh, you have a lot of uh, experience, you lived through the Cold War, you lived through 9-11, and you can tell us a lot about what is happening now. The first question, though, that I want to ask is a rather general one. And um, I was discussing with a lot of friends, with Boyan, I've been watching a lot of documentaries, discussions, and especially... Uh, discourses put forward by economists like Richard Wolff, who is warning about the U.S. failing economy and the inevitable change in term of terms of hegemonic of its hegemonic position. Would you agree with him that things are about to change from a unipolar to a multipolar world due to the current situation and other developments related to the economy? Okay, well, first of all, I think it's important that I point out that I am an authority on nothing. (laughs) Um, Over the years, and as you pointed out, I've lived a long time, which in itself is not uh, necessarily lend credibility. Uh, But what I have been able to do is talk to a lot of smart people, and I remember much of it. Um, So... And I mean that in all seriousness. Uh, I, I, you know, if I have any expertise, it's as a filmmaker, um, and I, I think I ask good questions. Uh, but I have not had the time, uh, preoccupation, or training to have real expertise in the kind of subjects I'm about to talk about. Uh, so I remain with an open mind on everything I'm about to say, um, and I think, in fact. You know, Engel said something very interesting right near the end of his life. Um, he said that, you know, we thought there would be a revolutions, revolutions across Europe uh, much sooner than there were. And, and in fact, you know, th- there really weren't in, during his lifetime. He said we were always playing catch up on the data. And, you know, if you're really going to do analysis, political analysis, geopolitical analysis, it should really be based on, first and foremost, economic data and other actual data. And in those days, uh, they didn't have uh, the kind of speed of data that we have now. Um, And so he said it was hard for us, for our analysis, to keep up with current events. In some ways, we almost have the opposite problem now. There's almost too much. Uh, There's a sea of data and contradictory data and and a sea of experts who contradict each other. Um, So to talk about the uh, demise of uh, American global capital uh, dominated led global capitalism, um, one really needs a handle on the data. Um, And I don't have it. And I don't know exactly who does, because as I say, there's such contradictory approaches to, in theory, the same data. So what do we know? Uh, We know that global capitalism is managed 
from the U United States. The Fed plays an extremely important role in, in dealing with periodic crises and, and sometimes big, enormous crises like 07, 08. Uh, the Fed not only propped up American banks, that propped up European banks, that loaned money to major corporations. And the, the global capitalist system is very dependent on the role of the United States as the largest economy and the reserve currency to manage this, what is essentially chaos. The system is extremely chaotic. And every so often this chaos breaks, break, you know, hits a breaking point in terms of the financial institutions and the Fed rushes in to save it. Now, the Chinese are so far dependent on that, as is every other country that's part of the global capitalist system, and China is. Uh, now, China may have some real socialist characteristics. Uh, you can debate whether it's socialist or not socialist, but you cannot debate that its economy is now fundamentally integrated in global capitalism. And up until now, as I said, Global capitalism depends on the strength and power of the United States to keep it within some kind of organized and functioning system. And because the United States plunders the world because of its dominant position in global capitalism and because it's such a large developed market, it has the resources uh, to do this and it can just make up uh, trillions of dollars of money. But it's not just made up money. Um, Brookings Institute did a study of how, how, what is the actual dollar figure of assets in American hands? Um, this is actual assets after all liabilities in private hands. And, and came, I, I, my, my memory was it was something like $95 trillion. Now, the whole GDP of the United States is what? Now, 18 or 19 trillion or something. And China's approaching the same number. So $95 trillion is a lot of money. So when the Americans just quote unquote make up money, it's not like they don't have in, in theory assets behind all that made up money. Like, you know, you take a, a very poor country, can't just make up a lot of money because it not only is it not the reserve currency, but, you know, in terms of resources and market and all the rest, it doesn't actually have the wealth well, United States does. Uh, the other thing, China needs the American market at least as much, at least until now, or, or and for, I would think, in the near future, every bit as much as the Americans want and need the Chinese market. Uh, the, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine and now the uh, kicking out of Russia from the Western banking system and so on and so on, I don't see how that changes the fundamental uh, mutual dependency of the Chinese and American economies for now. And I think, so, so right now I do not see some great demise of American capitalism. Uh, it, it's possible that the uh, Republicans uh, look like they're going to take Congress in, in uh, 2022. To, uh, if they took the presidency in 2024, uh, it, it could introduce even more chaos into the American political system, which is practically dysfunctional now. But it should be understood that dysfunction works to the interest of the American oligarchy, the American elites. They like when Congress is paralyzed because on the whole, they don't want anything passed in terms of, you know, increased taxation or regulation and so on. So paralysis in Congress is good for them. Uh, a Republican president who's not completely a maniac, uh, and Trump in their eyes became one, and the evidence of that is on January 6th, uh, when the attack on Capitol Hill was taking place, the uh, Association of American Manufacturers, which is the largest corporate lobbying uh, organization in DC, uh, an hour after the doors of Capitol Hill were breached, uh, issued a press release calling for Vice President Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment, which allows the vice president and the majority of cabinet and some other senior people to actually remove Trump. And they called for him to remove Trump uh, because they thought not having a peaceful transition of power was mad. 
And they'd already gotten what they want out of Trump. Anyway, the point is the American political system is, is increasingly dysfunctional. But that doesn't mean the, the, as an economic gorilla, it's so dysfunctional and, and, and so on. So do I think we're witnessing the demise of American-led, dominated global capitalism? Uh, eventually, sure. Uh, but what's that Mark Twain quote? The ex uh, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. People have been predicting this for every single year, as long as I can remember the demise of American-led global capitalism. Because the point is, what's the alternative? You know, eventually, maybe, China will emerge and there will be a real another center of capitalism, Chinese style. Uh, but it isn't Russia that's going to be the, de the determining factor of, of, of when that happens. So, so I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but no, I, I, I because well, no, but, I, I, what's the alternative for China right now? It, there really isn't one. So I don't know. I don't, unless we're talking very long term, I don't see any short term demise. Yes, but what is the alternative in general? Because let's say that we witness the transition from this unipolar world where the U.S. holds all the cards to a multipolar world. Oh, I'm sorry, what then maybe, the okay, hey, hang on, just let me just, maybe I didn't really answer your question. I don't think we're in a uni unipolar world anymore now. You okay. know, the, the single superpower world is over with. Uh, and, and you know, the strength of China, certainly, and I don't know, we'll see how, where Russia ends up in all this, but certainly Russia had a independent for better or worse, I'm not so sure it was for the better, but at any rate, Russia had an independent uh, ability to use its military in a way that most other countries under the U.S. umbrella do not. Uh, so, no, I, I don't think we're, we're already not in a single superpower world, but that's not the same as the demise of American-led global capitalism. That's two different issues. Yes, I think the distinction is important and it somehow anticipated my next question because let us assume, as you said, that China takes over, but are we really so naive to think that things are going to suddenly change for the better just because you have basically another boss, another leader? Because in my understanding, neither China, Russia, or another superpower, they don't want to change the system fundamentally. They just want to be, to be, um, to have a seat at the table or to be the leaders. They don't want to fundamentally change the system. So, yeah. I, well, what I, I don't imagine in any foreseeable future, China, quote unquote, takes over. Uh, I see China becoming increasingly an equal power. Uh, on the other hand, so far, um, it does not have a global military footprint at almost at all. And, and I don't see that they plan to. And, and I also th think that having a global military footprint is highly overrated. Uh, what exactly has it done for the United States to have this fantastic global military reach. Uh, every major war that the United States has been in, they've essentially lost. You know, they, they fought to a stalemate in Korea. They lost in Vietnam. They essentially lost in Iraq. Uh, I'm probably missing a whole a bunch of, you know, the, they were successful. Afghanistan. Yeah, Afghanistan, lost in Afghanistan. Uh, they, they, were gr they had a glorious victory in uh, Granada. You know, they, they were able to invade Panama and kidnap uh, Marcos, uh, Marcos, I guess, uh, if I'm remembering his name correctly. Torijos, I think it was his name in Panama. Was, yeah, Torijos. I mean, you know, to a large extent, this massive military might has been just a boondoggle of money making for the military industrial complex. Uh, what's been effective in terms of asserting U.S. power has been financial blackmail funding opposition, which essentially means the activity of the CIA. And the CIA on the whole has, has had some real victories and, and been quite effective. Um, so, uh, you know, I, there's a book called Spoils of War by uh, Andrew Colburn. And he makes the argument that 
to a large extent, these wars, the object was money making. It never was winning. And, and much of the weapon systems that are, have been built uh, as part of this military industrial complex, d don't even work. Uh, they're just really about money making. Um, that said, the Americans do have the ability to throw tons of the most advanced ar you know, arms into Ukraine and other places. So it's not like it's nothing. But China is not vying for that. On the other hand, China's already the major training partner of most of the countries of Latin America. So they've already supplanted the U.S. in, in many ways without any military pro projection at all. So we'll see where this all ends up, uh, except all I can say is that it's extremely dangerous. Uh, a multipolar world is, is, you know, in some respects, it will be good that it balances U.S. power in certain places. In other respects, it could get very dangerous if one of these rising powers actually decides to want to extend its power even more. And of course, with China, the, the, the thing is, the, the, you know, there's this famous quote from uh, Putin. He's asked uh, uh, if, there, if there was a nuclear attack on Russia uh, and you were faced with a choice of a counterattack, knowing it would end the world, would you do it? And his answer is, what, well, what would be the point of a world without a Russia? The, th the thing is, I think the American elites also think to themselves, well, what's the point of a world without America in charge of it? Mm. Uh, they're willing to risk the apocalypse. And, and of course, it will be over Taiwan. Uh, and, it's, it, it, and the problem with the United States, it's a combination of two horrible forces. One is money making. They're willing to risk the apocalypse, nuclear weapons, almost war with China uh, over Taiwan in order to make increasingly amounts of money. And then the other really dark force that doesn't get talked about is the strength of Christian nationalism, uh, who, who make a, a serious port, uh, part of the American military, uh, at, including at senior levels. Um, there's uh, various organized uh, Christian nationalist uh, groups that are very influential at the most senior levels of American government. There's one called The Family. Yes, oh, yes, I've seen the documentary on Netflix about it. It's yeah. a different thing. Or People should that. watch that documentary because while it doesn't get kind of to the systemic analysis we might like, it's quite chilling. The, this this far-right Christian nationalist group that's been organizing at senior levels of government in the U.S., but many other countries around the world, and who also have seen up at least till recently Putin as a hero of Christian nationalism, a defender of the faith, They've hosted every presidential breakfast in the United States since Eisenhower. They, every president has to go to their bloody breakfast every year and pay, pay homage to, to this uh, Christian nationalist. So there's very dark forces at work. And, and, and the extent to which they are willing, especially with China, to accept a, an atheistic equal power. And don't you can't underestimate how insane this ideology is. Steve Bannon, a few years ago, he zoomed into a meeting that was taking place at the Vatican, Vatican, hosted by Cardinal Burke, who's a very right wing Catholic yes, cardinal, yes. part of Opus Dei. Uh, they had something called the Family Foundation or something. Um, Burke's a guy who's been trying to overthrow. Pope Francis, because they mm -hmm. don't like that he's too much of a social democrat. Bannon says in this meeting, and it's it's available. I, in fact, I've used it in a few stories I did. Bannon says there is a bloody cathartic struggle coming with Islam and atheistic China. And of course, the underpinnings, the economic underpinnings of this is that the United States simply doesn't want to imagine a world they're not dominant in. And, and China, both in terms of its economic power and the fact that it's atheistic and so on, fits right into the, the group. So, so this multipolar world comes with a lot of dangerous features to it. It's not up to us whether it's happening or not. It's, it's happening. Can, can I just ask one question here? Because you said about all those dark forces, and it's pretty chilling, in fact. But uh, before that, you also said that for... Uh, 
for, for the elite, financial elite, for those people who manage the capitalist economy in America and in the world to a large extent, they, they don't care so much about things being in order in terms of the political arrangements. And, you know, I'm thinking that perhaps, you know, all those dark forces, they would like to see some kind of political representation in, in order to project their power all, you know, on the world, like not only in terms of the economy, but also in terms of, you know, the, the, the political arrangement that, uh, you know, that is going to put some countries, some governments, some regions of the world behind those dark forces. And I wonder whether, you know, when you look at, you know, Joe Biden today, you've, like, he is a dark force in and out of himself, like he barely copes with the reality. And I just wonder whether they would not like to see someone more competent, not necessarily as mad as Trump maybe, but someone more competent to actually facilitate the political process that they need in order to lead the world in any way they imagine they they, they could do that. And and I'm, I'm, I just wonder whether this to you might appear as some kind of, uh, you know, as a problematic moment for the empire like in a sense that they are not able those those dark forces to come together to the extent to even you know put forward some sort of meaningful leadership that is going to be at least th that is going to pretend to inspire some other people and stuff like that. Well, the the the, the first thing to understand, I think, is that it's chaos. This is not some well organized, centrally planned machine. This is chaos. Uh, even in their attitude to China. Uh, while George, Sor George Soros viciously publicly attacked Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock, the big asset management company, for increasing its investments in China. Uh, because Soros is totally, his whole identity is about fighting authoritarianism. And, you know, he still believes there's, well, there is some democracy left in the United States, not much, but whatever. Uh, so L Larry Fink essentially told him to go screw himself. Um, Vanguard, another major asset management fund, almost as big as BlackRock, is pulling out of China. Uh, Apple is investing more in China. Their next iPhone is going to be based on, on a Chinese semiconductor chip. And, I, I, you know, not a Taiwan, entirely Taiwanese chip, which is interesting because I wasn't, I didn't know China even had such an advanced chip, but maybe for phones they do. So there's a, there's a division there, which is, a section of finance capital, and I would say probably most, a section of consumer-based capital, like all the big tech and others, they will not give up on access to the Chinese market. And they don't like policy, especially antagonizing to, oh, issues over Taiwan, that might shut them out of this massive market. I mean, the Chinese market is going to be larger than the American market. And, you know, you can't give up on that because, you know, some geo geopolitics and, and they don't give a, sh you know, they want that market. And so, so there's a split. On the other hand, the military industrial complex needs and wants as much possible tension. They need as much almost war and maybe some actual wars, but almost war is almost good enough in as many places as possible. So if you can have it in Ukraine, great. If you can have almost war over Taiwan, great. Um, the Saudis are f in Yemen. I mean, the more shit goes on, the better. Now, it's not true that most business doesn't want some kind of order. They do. You can't do normal business without functioning laws and functioning government. And states. Except, except for arms and fossil fuel. Fossil fuel and arms love chaos. They love volatility, but the rest more or less don't. I mean, finance can always make money out of volatility, but you need some kind of rules-based order to, for American capital to dominate. And, and, the, and it's another issue here. It's way too expensive to dominate strictly through military power. You know, the days of old colonization are over where you can just send your troops in and run a place. It's, it, people fight, you know, tend to fight back and it becomes too expensive. So you need a state, you need laws, you need that state to have uh, armed force to make those laws real. 
And our, our business doesn't function very well because people tend to say, well, fuck you. We want that oil. It's ours. Why should you have it? Uh, you know. But Paul, can, so, I, can I just ask one more supplementary question to that? Because, uh, of course, it's very logical, absolutely logical, everything you just said. Uh, but then vis-a-vis -vis the sanctions on Russia, which are happening right now, where it seems like, to some extent at least, maybe it's temporary, I don't know, we'll see how the situation unfolds, but the political decisions seem to have overwhelmed somehow the uh, economic logic, capitalist economic logic, because... Uh, I don't know what the situation exactly is in the United States, but uh, when I look at the European Union or Western Europe or, or Europe in general, then I can see what they are doing uh, is suicide. That's that's what's happening right now, like economic suicide. And everybody is trembling in their shoes, particularly those European leaders, quote unquote, like uh, Scholz or von der Leyen. You know, they try to appear tough. Because they are, you know, they are under the thumb of America, and they they, they finally now have their hegemon back, and and you know after Trump and this trauma and so on and so forth, and they've always been very Russophobic, like throughout modern history. So it's great, like it's win-win situation politically for them. But they see that, and and everyone can see that. Like if I can see that, then they can see that too. Everything that they are doing is just another shot in their own body. Like you know, well, Lord, me, well yeah. here's what I. What I think is happening. First of all, the United States could care less what happens to the European people. Oh, yeah. If you if you know anything about American nuclear war strategy, uh, the first thing to go always was Europe, and the Americans Americans couldn't care less. Number two, the Europeans. This is one of the in insanities of what Putin has done here. Uh, you know, every analyst that knew anything about the situation was saying surrounding Ukraine is dividing NATO. Invading Ukraine will unite NATO. It, everyone said it. It was kind of obvious, and it's exactly what's happened. Um, but the, the actual invasion of Ukraine has opened up a door for Europe that I don't think they would ever seriously have put their handle, hand on the handle before. And that's Europe as an independent military power. And to some extent, even though it looks like they're more and more under the U.S. thumb, and to, yeah, but uh, the increase in German militarization, uh, the talk about an independent militarized Europe, they're starting to look ahead to 2022 and 2024 to a Trumpist kind of uh, either Trump himself or someone the equivalent of a, of a Christian nationalist crazy person running the United States. And they're starting to say, you know what, we maybe we really need to. And then, and also now that Russia actually invaded Ukraine, because they didn't, they didn't, I don't think really believe Russia was really a threat right up until the last minute. Even Zelensky was saying, Russia's actually not going to invade. By crossing that line, now they see, one, chaos coming from the United States. And two, a Russian threat they never, they talked about, but never really believed was real. Now they believe it's real. So I, I, I can imagine in Europe, the, the forces of really right-wing militarized uh, politics is really going to emerge, whether it comes in the form of, you know, outright Le Pen kind of thing. I know right now she's soft on Russia, but the long, longer term role here uh, is, is, we'll see. But, but certainly in Germany, they're talking about a mighty militarized uh, Germany. And they don't, want, they don't like the idea of uh, a Russia that's willing to cross these kinds of lines. So it, it's chaos uh, is, is the bottom line. And the problem with this kind of chaos is that, you know, shit happens and war breaks out, except these days it could be nuclear. Yes. Can I, can I, just, can I just address one thing yes. you, you said about the... The, the in the, in the U.S. there is a there's a serious division here between the forces that have been unleashed, which is the Trumpist forces, which include a, a significant, very wealthy section of the uh, billionaire class, including you know Coke and others, but there's many of them, who who internalize a lot of this extreme Christian nationalism. They are you know they're they're, you, they're believers. They're, they're, you know, of course, it serves their economic interests in a way, but 
but they are believers. And they're, in, they're at real odds, not just with the normal corporate leadership as reflected by the Biden administration. They're at odds with the uh, normal Republican Party leadership uh, as exemplified by Dick Cheney uh, and, and much of the military leadership. Uh, but, they, but they've opened this, this bottle, this Pandora's box, uh, in order to get, uh, and this starts, you could say, to some extent with Reagan or even Goldwater, but in order to get massive tax cuts, uh, deregulation, to undo the New Deal, which has been the prime mission since World War II, to undo the uh, compromises that were made with the American working class during the 1930s, to undo the social safety net, to reduce wages, to break unions. Uh, that's been the prime objective. And they unleashed these forces of religious extremism to strengthen their hand. So whole sections of the working class would vote for uh, candidates who were after them. <laughs> Uh, including outsourcing with global uh, globalization and all the rest, so it's it's a it's a it's a witch's brew. And so if I was in Europe, I wouldn't want to hitch my wagon to that for very long. Yeah, yeah. But since you mentioned that you know witches and all other metaphysical elements uh, in 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 the whole thing, I want to ask. Uh, ask you to elaborate a little bit on the psychology of it, like to the extent that you can do that as a political analyst, of course, uh, because it, as Maria pointed out in the beginning, you you know you've lived through the Cold War parts of it at least, and you've you've witnessed 9/11 and you know the the hysteria, the psychosis that developed right afterwards, uh, and and this Islamo Islamophobia, Islamophrenia, maybe is even a better word, uh, and now you see the those attitudes. Uh, the uh, ag aggressiveness and and the kind of unhinged uh, hysterical you know canceling of Russia I don't even know how to uh, how to describe it like what phrase to use like you know from banning Russian cats from participating in, in all kinds of uh, you know pet shows and stuff like that to to Tchaikovsky being banned from uh, the Philharmonie in in Berlin and stuff like that I, I wonder whether there is a comparison. I wonder whether you know the Red Scare and the. the yeah, there's a comparison. There's a there good a comparison. comparison. So, so oh, it's yeah. not something exceptional. The way, the way really... Catholics kill. How about the way Catholics killed Protestants? In, no, no, in no. Europe, I know. Uh, look, but, but I mean, I, it's insane. Trying... Yeah, it's, it's insane. insane. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering. I, I'm wondering whether the dynamics of it are are similar. Whether it rings a bell when you when you when you watch it, when you see this kind of thing going against Russia in, all over the Western media. And then is it something that resembles what happened, for example, after 9-11? Is it pretty much the same playbook and, and the same thing? Because, you know, when I look at it, when I look at it, I'm thinking that, you know, without being a psychologist or sociologist or without even having a university degree, I'm just, I, I just wonder how, how long can you keep people that hyped up emotionally? How, how long can it take before, you know, the, 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 the sort of tipping point uh, is reached because, uh, you know, a friend of mine actually made a, uh, a comment recently saying that people in Poland in particular, they seem to be drunk. They seem to be high on their emotions. And, you know, when the hangover comes and everybody starts talking about what kind of stupid things they've done the past night when they were <laughs> drunk or high, this is going to be a very difficult moment for them, let alone that they're going to be three, four, five, ten times poorer than they are now. And I just wonder whether, you know, it's it's the same psycho psychological mechanism where it's the same sort of pattern and whether, you know, it falls off naturally at one point or whether you think that it's it's different, more intense, worse, somehow more dangerous maybe? Americans, and I, 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 it's not only Americans, I'm sure to some extent it's true lots of places, but maybe more in the United States. Um deeply, deeply ingrained in much of the American identity um, is fear of the other. Um, whether it's fear of the black slaves are going to come and get you at, in, the, in the night, uh, where, whether it's fear of the native peoples, indigenous peoples are going to come and scalp you. Um, of course, when you're an aggressor trying to wage genocide against native people, they might fight back uh, and, and you enslave people. There may be slave rebellions, but let's not think too much about that part. Um, the fear of the other is nothing new. 
uh, you know, how many hundreds and hundreds of years of wars in Europe uh, fear of the uh, of the French Catholics and versus the English Protestants, or fear of this sect of Catholics versus that sect of Catholics. I mean, it's, it's something ruling classes, the church, and, and the new church, which is the media, which you know plays the role that the church used to play. Um, it's their bread and butter. It's their stock and trade. So, the more modern form of fear of the other has been anti-communism. And the, this began even before the Russian Revolution and went into higher gear after the Russian Revolution. Uh, and of course, after World War II, uh, there, there was ex extremely conscious, deliberate uh, attempt to purge uh, the American politics of anything progressive and left wing with McCarthyism and the House of Un-American Activities Committee and much more. Decades and decades of propaganda. The Soviets are going to blow you up with nuclear bombs. They're going to invade. Uh, you know, the Red Scare never went away. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very ingrained. Like you're, a baby's born in the United States uh, now and before, but now. And in much of America, their education, public education system has been so decimated they can barely show you the capitals of most of the states in their own country. Never mind find countries on a map in Europe or somewhere else. Um, they live in practically medievalism, much of the population, in many respects, not what they have to do in terms of day-to-day -day work. But, you know, I was in Afghanistan and I made a film there and, and I was at a coffee house or, and there was a bunch of guys sitting around, truck drivers, and, you know, they knew how to drive trucks, modern trucks. They knew how to operate modern AK-47s. But they thought Canada geographically bordered Germany. I mean, they had never seen a globe, never seen a map. And it occurred to me, you know, the sections of America that aren't too much further ahead. Um, so we're and, and why is the education system like that? Because corporate America doesn't need educated people. This is certainly not about history, certainly not about geography. And, and there's been a, a deliberate, conscious attempt to uh, fund and spread Christian extremism and, and so on, in the, especially in rural America. Um, the urban, the cities are not so different, the big cities, from a Canadian city or even European city politically. But that doesn't mean they can't get whipped into a frenzy against Russia, especially, uh, you know, the way the Democratic Party loves to even outdo the, the Republicans in terms of summoning up the demons of the Cold War. Um, so it, it, it's not a homogeneous thing because there's a, a weird element in all this, which is some of the Trumpist forces saw Putin as a hero. And it's not so easy to get some of them uh, because they're Christian nationalists and Putin's a defender of the faith. And Putin's been f supporting and funding some of the far-right Christian nationalism in Europe. They're a little amb ambiguous or ambivalent, I should say, about what's going on now. But it's not like it's so positive because they, <laughs> they want war with China. So, uh, But if you're asking me, uh, how does this culture get ingrained? It's not monolithic. You've got to separate big cities from rural. In the big cities, it's far more progressive. Uh, there, there's a lot more generally anti-war sentiment, like on the Iraq war and such. But what Putin has done with this invasion, he has pushed so many people that were so anti-NATO, anti-US aggression, anti-US imperialism, pushed so many of them into a camp which is winding up practically pro-NATO. And so it's, it's, it's made the politics even more poisonous in the United States. Yes. And the last question, what is your biggest fear? I mean, what is the worst case scenario in your opinion? With you, what's happening now with Ukraine? And yes. Is, well, well, first of all, I, I do want to say with, because uh, I haven't, I don't think I've had a chance to say this clearly uh, as much as I think, uh, U.S. imperialism and and such helped create helped contribute to the conditions that led to the Russian invasion. Nobody made Putin do this. 
Uh, I don't believe he did it to defend Donbass because it, from according to the United Nations, from 2018 to 2021, there were 310 civilians killed in Donbass by the Ukrainian forces. That is not a genocide or, or imminent genocide. I don't think Russia uh, was in fear of imminent uh, attack from Ukraine or anybody else. Um, I don't think the government in, in Kyiv was run by Nazis, even though, yes, there's organized uh, Nazi militias, uh, uh, no doubt, and, and who have a lot of influence, but they weren't running the government. Um, I, I don't think there was any justification for this invasion. I think it was illegal. I think there was war crimes being committed. And, and no doubt the United States has done worse. And no doubt what's going on in Yemen is probably worse. And the uh, starvation and destruction of Afghanistan has killed far more people than are, are being killed in Ukraine. So what? It doesn't change the fact uh, that what Russia did was uh, unjustified. Uh, there were other ways to deal with this. Uh, and certainly under uh, international law, there was no imminent threat. So none of this critique of U.S. and NATO in any way, in any way, justifies this Russian invasion. Okay, what's the most dangerous, my worst fear? Obviously, two things. Um, in the short term, uh, nuclear war. Uh, it, is, it is so easy to have a mistake, to have a missile, to have something misinterpreted. Uh, you know, we know that in 1983, um, just because uh, Reagan was conducting uh, NATO exercises and Andrew, Andropov, the uh, president of Russia, actually thought they were getting ready for a first strike. And it just happened on one day, uh, the alignment with the moon was such that uh, radar bounced back looking like missiles. And, and, and if it hadn't been for one guy, one Russian guy in the radar station who didn't tell Andropov what was happening, uh, we wouldn't be here talking about this. Um, so in this kind of situation, it is so dangerous. Um, obviously, if the United States had any rationality at all, and, 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 and they would say right now, let's sit down and negotiate a way to get nuclear arms out of this scenario, get NATO off the table. Clearly, Ukraine's not getting into NATO. Uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainian government itself should have said, we don't, we're, we, there's no point even talking talking about it anymore, which Zelensky said for a while and doesn't seem to have recently. They get NATO off the damn table. Yeah, but he said it way too late. If he had said it five, he, five weeks earlier, that I think yeah. would have changed the course of events. But you know, Absolutely. instead of that, Absolutely. he was just fooling around saying that we're going to get nukes now. So before No, I, I, think what he, I, I think the Americans told him to shut up because I think the Americans wanted the Russians to invade. They didn't yeah. want a, res a resolution of this. But Putin is the one that decided to do it. And, and so the condemnation has to start with him, no matter what urged him or contributed to it. Um, what's dangerous now is obviously we are so on edge that the slightest mistake could lead to accidental nuclear war. Number two, tactical nuclear weapons are being talked about as if they are some realistic choice. Tactical nuclear weapons are being talked about as if it could stay limited and tactical. And it's insane because no, no po nuclear power is willing to lose. So let's say a conventional fight is such. And so the Russians say, OK, we're going to lose this in conventional means. So we're now telling you we're going to use low yield nukes because we won't lose conventionally. What do you really think the Americans and NATO are going to say, OK, go ahead, we won't respond? It's impossible it doesn't spiral into full-scale nuclear war. So that's number two. It's it, 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 insanity. Ellsberg calls it institutional madness. And it's been this way for decades and decades. But this is even tenser and crazier. And then number two, and, and, and let's assume so far saner heads have briefed prevailed, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So let's hope for the best on that. But one thing is absolutely for sure. Climate change is coming. We are going to hit 1.5. The prediction now, if all goes oh, honky-dory, we're going to hit 
by 2033, you know, just a little more than 10 years. 1.5 is a tipping point. You don't get to 1.5 and stabilize, not the way we're going. You get to 1.5, another 10, 15 years or so, 20, you're at two. You get to two, you're at three, four. So we are talking about a world within 10 or 20 years, maybe sooner, and, and the maybe sooner is very important because the timing predictions are based on the existing systems of carbon absorption, say the oceans, continuing to do what they're doing as they're doing it. But there's a lot of processes taking place in the oceans where they may not. And if the oceans stop absorbing as much carbon as they are, then these, all these date predictions go out the window and it could all happen much sooner. So imagine millions and tens of hundreds of millions of people in the global south have to move north. Now what? Imagine what's happening to global supply chains. Imagine what happens to lack of uh, resources and water. Uh, one of the climate scientists I interviewed, he's, a, he's one of the authors of the IPCC report, last report. He works for the Canadian government. He's a sober guy. He says, by the time we hit 1.5 and heading towards 2, most of the American agriculture in the Midwest is gone. So what happens to the United States when most of their agriculture is gone because of drought? And then, of course, you know, West Virginia, where Joe Manchin comes from, is, a, is, is the number one state in the country susceptible to catastrophic flooding, more than even Florida. What's coming within 10, 20 years is entirely catastrophic. You know, you know, you're alarmist, you're alarmist. Yeah, I'm alarmist because it's goddamn alarming. And the, the invasion of Ukraine, the IPCC report comes out on a Monday. By Tuesday, it's off, it's out of the news cycle because of the war. Russia, this massive fossil fuel uh, based economy, is is now you know, it even more dependent on that. And of course, China is going to soak up all that fossil fuel. Nobody's putting any pressure uh, to get off it. I mean, obviously, if, if there was any rationality in this world, uh, United States and China would get together, offer Russia a Marshall Plan to help get off fossil fuel, as the United States does the same thing for itself. It obviously should nationalize its own fossil fuel companies, phase them out. But we're so far from that, and, and especially we're just further from any rational climate policy because of this war than we were, even though I can't say it was particularly rational even bef before it. But now it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's beyond insane. I mean, the fact of the matter is, let's be honest, we are going to hit two degrees. It's not if. We are entering a world of uh, where half the planet is practically unlivable. And we're going to really... You know, we need to have that conversation uh, and all, the, all every piece of geopolitical analysis that doesn't take this into account, honestly, is bullshit. Well, on that very positive note, <laughs> we will end the conversation, not before uh, me saying something. Uh, for a long while, the fossil fuel um, and all major corporations tried to sell doubt and tried to say that not all scientists agree about climate change. And there is a researcher, her name is Naomi Oreskes, who had the will and the stubbornness to go through all the important articles and books that were ever published about climate change. And she proves scientifically that all scientists agree that there is a clear connection between what we humans are doing and climate change. And you better look her up if you don't believe me, because she had... Uh, the audacity and the stubbornness to do it. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, uh, Boyan, Thank you. for the conversation. And to our viewers, I hope you liked it. And to the extent that you feel that you can 
support us to support independent journalism from Eastern Europe, please go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash the barricade and make a donation, a monthly subscription. So thank you so much. And we'll see you in the next segment of our show. <laughs>